so I promised myself when I was a kid that I would never, like my father, become a grumpy old man. I, I thought that he was too serious. I wonder why he was so irritated and so agitated all the time. I was there, you know, running around in the hallways, jumping around, touching the ceiling, thinking, you know, imagining playing basketball. And my dad was really agitated with me. So I promised myself that I would never be that way. And I broke that promise this week when Nathan came into the living room and said to me, Daddy, why are you so serious? Take it easy, man. Chill out. I found myself in this story that I promised myself that I'll never find myself in. But something I didn't know when I was a child, that ignorance is bliss. You see, when you're a child, you have no concept of time. You have no concept of obligation. You have no concept of money. When you are a child, everything is taken care of for you. You have no stress. We tell this to Nathan and get angry at him all the time, especially at a home right around 730. My wife is putting Josh to sleep and Nathan cannot shut up. He is so loud. I don't know where he gets that from. He is obnoxiously loud and he cannot, it does not compute for him in his mind that if he's loud, Josh will wake up. And if Josh wakes up, my wife will suffer. And if my wife will suffer, who suffers? Me. And I keep telling him over and over again, Nathan, you need to shut up. He's like, daddy, chill out. He doesn't know what type of moments happen, how the night is ruined by this. He has no concept of stress. He's not stressed out. He's taking it easy, man. Why? Because there's no pressure and there's no obligations. Now, for many of us in this room, that is our daily struggle, isn't it? How do we meet our obligations? and the time to meet it. And therefore there's pressure because we have bills to pay. And on top of that, we have to do it in a certain time. And then there is those relational obligations. If you're dating, if you're married, if you're not married, not dating, all stress, right? Sometimes people go, oh, only if I was married, I wouldn't have any stress. And then people that are married, oh, I wouldn't have any stress if I wasn't married. It's a catch 22. But here it is. We need to go back to the concept of where this idea of stress comes in. What is the root of stress? The actual root of it. Not the expressions, not the fruit, but I'm talking about the actual cause. The first cause of why we feel this anxiety to control our world. Well, we try to control our world because it's not safe. We can miss deadlines. We cannot meet our obligations. We might not be able to do these things and that in the amount of time allowed it. The Bible tells us again and again, and we study this for the last couple of weeks, right? Ephesians 5, 18, the fruit. Tell your neighbor, the fruit. Tell them next to you, fruit. Not fruits, fruit, singular. Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. This is a paradigm in which when God invades your life, or if you're a Christian, Jesus lives in you and, is, and leads your life, the evidence, the expression of the fruit are those things. I want those things, but they're not evident in my life all the time, right? Or not in yours. Right? We talked about two weeks ago, Philippians 4, Paul says, you know, let your gentleness, kindness be evident to all for the Lord is near. Rejoice in the Lord. Always rejoice in the Lord. But we're not always rejoicing. And this is why it's important 
if we want the expression, stress is an expression of a, of a root. Peace is an expression of a root. So let's study. The first time in history, written in the narrative Genesis, how the actual physiology of the universe changed in the Garden of Eden. Historians have called this place the Garden of the Lord. It's in historical documents. But Moses in the Pentateuch tells it to a Jewish audience, of course, in an oral matter. And he talks about how stress and the root of it entered the world. And if we can understand that better, I think we can really tackle it in a much better way of how we deal with these experiences of our life. So let's go to this text, Genesis 3, and answer the question, what is the root of stress? What is it? Well, verse 17 of the narrative of Genesis, God says to Adam, to Adam he said, because you listened what? To your wife. (laughs) because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree. See, it's the woman's fault, right? But if you read the text before, it says that God, Adam was with her, okay? You listen and um, ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Read that part with me. It says what? Cursed. Now, I'm not sure if you know this, but being cursed is not a good thing, right? (laughs) Curse is bad. Curse is the opposite of blessing. So God is saying that something has entered the planet or the universe, the very physiology, the very physics of how everything operates in this world. Now, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. Now, that's a bad predicament. Some of our members at our church just came back from Cancun. We hate you, whoever you were. No, no, we love you, superficially. But but anyway... How do you go from a place of paradise to a place that's cursed? Because the Garden of Eden, according to historians and according to Moses, it was a place of of perfection, a place of self-sustenance. So there's this crazy shift that takes place. And because something is cursed, things don't go right. There is a lack of stress enters. Now, because you have to work. And if you don't work hard enough, you might not be able to eat. And if you don't get a job and work, you might not, you might not have a roof of your head or have food in your stomach or provide for your family. So now the shift of humanity goes from, as scripture says, being rulers of the earth to working the earth. Right? What do you do for most of your life? You work for these basic human needs. Of course you're stressed out. But what does it mean for the ground to be cursed? Well, let me give you an example. One time, the staff and I, we were outside about after lunch going out, you know, just walking. And this is usually how Peeves walks. And he was walking and he steps on crap right? And it goes all over his shoe. And that's not the worst part about it because the ground, you know, the Bible says what? Cursed. But Peeves is especially cursed with this type of excretion for some reason. And he steps on it. And the worst part about this is not stepping on poop. It's actually going to Andrew's car because Andrew is very anal about his stuff because he knows the economy of his life and the economy. You can't get two cars. You can't get more than this. There's limited amount of things. So Andrew goes, here's a plastic bag. Put your foot in it. (laughs) Peeves is like, dude, uh, I'm going to put my feet up. I'm going to put my feet up. He's like, and then every five seconds, did you put your shoe? Did you put your foot in the bag? And I'm just like, poor guy. 
You know, and he's like, I forgot which foot. And, and Andrew was getting mad. What? You forgot, you know, and, and this whole chaos. And that's what it means for something to be cursed. You have to, I mean, you have to worry about excretion. You have to worry about these probabilities. I mean, I don't want to talk about the time when Peeps was at Union Square Park and a bird pooped on him. <laughs> a guy is trying to tell him something. No, I, I mean... I'm serious. So it's not just physio, you know, it's just not the physical part of concrete that's cursed. It's the world that has changed, shift economically. Our economics has changed drastically as a result of the fall in this garden. What changed the, the whole premise of economics? I know you probably took it in college, but let me try to explain it to you in the simplest way possible. Economics at the very core basic meaning is that you need to live economically, which means it's based on scarcity, that there isn't enough to go around. That's, you have to, you have to, you know, manage risk. You have to live on a budget, but the whole premise is there isn't enough. Scarce. And that's the shift that took place here in this passage. No wonder there's so much stress. The root is spiritual, folks. The root of stress is, first and foremost, spiritual. It is not natural. What happens in the probability of this world and the scarcity and the lack of probability is because the result of the curse, which is spiritual first, and then an expression in the natural. There's some of you, because of this change in economics, this shift in economics, you know, if you read the beginning of Genesis, God says to Adam and Eve, subdue the earth, rule the earth, and then he says, be fruitful and multiply. You know what that means, right? Don't read into it. Be fruitful and multiply, meaning have a lot of kids. I don't think Adam and Eve were going, but honey, how are we going to pay for it? Do we need to buy a minivan? No, there was no stress because of the garden, the economy of the garden, there was no provisions needed for money or a currency because the garden itself was sustaining. It was in the economy of God, not in the economy of man. There's some of you right now, you don't even have a girlfriend. You don't even have a boyfriend, but you're worried about how you're going to feed your kids. How am I going oh to buy a house? You don't even have a girl. You're worried about it. That's the economy of this place when stress enters the earth. So what is the actual root of stress? Well, first lesson we learn from this narrative is what? It is what? A deep economical shift from dependency, dependence on God to independence. It is a deep economical shift from dependence on God to independence. That is the root, the cause, the first cause of stress. So what is this application for the Christian? If you're a Christian and you're stressed out and I'm stressed out, what is the expression? It means just like Adam, we're taking the place of God. Because it's our universe, is our life. Therefore, it's my economy. The whole point of the gospel is that you are, the, Paul says, the curse is broken by Jesus. The redemption is you live now in the economy of God. Dependence on God, not independence from God. So it really shows the root of our life, where our source comes from. So where is the stress in your life today? If you're a believer, it simply means that you have taken life into your own hands. That you believe that you live in the economy of this world and not the economy of God, and therefore have no faith 
in how God will provide for your life and for not even for your basic needs, but for your purpose. Sometimes I don't understand how Christians could be Christians and be worried about this all the time, even though I do too. It's a paradox. We believe in destiny, the sexiness of destiny. God's going to do amazing things for my life. God has a wonderful plan. Oh, yeah, I believe that. Oh, but yeah, I'm not sure if God's going to provide lunch for me. That is a really odd paradox because we believe only what we can see because we live in this economy and that has to be broken. Now, if we're not a Christian, what this shows us is pretty simple. You want to live in the economy of God because there's no way you can break the stress because two weeks ago, what I talked about, most of the stress that you have is something you can't control. It's in the sphere of concern, not even in the sphere of influence. There's nothing you can do about it. The government is trying to lower the unemployment rate, but they're having a hard time. Billions and billions and trillions of dollars still. Not helping that much. Another crisis happens in Europe, here and there. You don't know. It really boils down to, can I, do I want to, Handle this myself, which is the temptation in the garden in the first place. I want to be God. I want to live, lead my own life and my own choices. But we know how that ends in this passage. So I pray the Spirit of God will show you right now where you are and help you see the shift in your life and bring you back to dependency on God. Now let's move down. Now watch this. So we've seen first that the physiology of the universe changed. An economical shift, right? From dependency on God to independence. But now watch this, verse 16. Now we're going to talk about the woman. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. Thank God for epidural, right? <laughs> I'm telling you, it, it helps. I was there in twice. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Now, of course, Moses is not saying this is literally true, even though it is. You can see that it's true. And it says, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Meaning the intention of God for men and women, that co-relationship that was created, was never supposed to be patriarchal. You see that right there in this text. But your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now, this could be a generalization, but I think it's pretty empirical. Like, you know, I, I'm married to a woman, right? Some of you are women. How long does it t take you to get ready today? How long did it take? You're like, five minutes, my hair is beautiful when I wake up. I don't, I don't wear any makeup. I mean... Seriously, time is the issue here. Time. Because now we, we read verse 17. It says that you have to, the curse first is the ground. You have to work of it. So the pressure to provide and to meet those obligations are there. Now, you see, everything takes, takes time. Time is not, you know, relative anymore. You have a limited amount of time. You have to get ready you have to get where a certain time. You have to be at a certain time. Time is the reason why there's so much pressure, right? Your credit card bill is due on a certain time. How many people like that time? Right? Your rent is due on a certain time. No one likes that time. But now time is the reason why there's so much pressure. So you have to look at this and really capture this. It goes from a place of paradise, a place. I mean, how many people here, when you went on vacation to, you know, like a tropical place, like I love doing that with my kids, and I lay on the beach, and I listen to the ocean, and it's beautiful. Right, let me enjoy this moment for a second as I reminisce, right? It, it, it's time is just relative, meaning I have nowhere to go. I'm on the beach with my umbrella drink. This is what it was like here. Because your job was to rule, not to work. But now time is limited. 
So you see, that's why I think marriages, honeymoons might not be the best place to start a marriage. Because let me tell you right now, it will not be like that. It's a lie. <laughs> it's deception. It, the honeymoon, that's why they call it a honeymoon phase. It's an illusion. It's a lie. You will not, your relationship will not be like that. Nothing, I mean, if you get it in, in especially all-inclusive place, nothing will be free in life. Not even advice. You got to pay your therapist. <laughs> I mean, you, you got to really think about this. So time will no longer be relative. Time will be constrained. Right, you have to pick up the kids. Then you have to put them to sleep. And it is misery times an exponent. But yes, there's beauty in it, sort of. But I want to let you know that that is also the reason the pressure is intensified. That everything, when time is limited, is exaggerated. When you're stuck in traffic. When you're talking to someone, you have to get somewhere and they won't shut up. You're just like, oh, and then now what? Other people get the blunt of it, right? When you don't have time, you have to push people away. When you don't have time, you have to, what? Prioritize, but that's hard to do. So second, what is the root of actual stress? Well, it's what? It is a deep relational shift from being in paradise to being at a day job. So, there's no way to get time back because now the ground is cursed. So what's the remedy? What do we do when everything is falling apart in our lives and we feel like we can't keep everything running? What do we do? Well, either you keep being people in your life pay the price, being agitated, irritated, angry, because you can't get the things you need to get done in a certain amount of time. We have to develop this fellowship that we were created for with God. We have to drink deeply from the presence of God in our life. There is no other remedy. to go. We need to go back to the garden, and we can, maybe not physically, but in a spiritual sense, because Although the ground is cursed, the transformation, the garden is within us because Christ lives in us. The Bible tells us that we are the temple of God. If you are a Christian today, God lives inside of you, which means all tranquility, all peace. The Lord of peace, the Lord of the earth lives inside of us. And we need to be surrendered to him and in fellowship with him and give him the stress. We have to unload it on him. Then we have the fruit, the expression of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. If we don't drink deeply from God, other people pay the price. If we drink deeply from God, the what? The flow, the overflow of the love of God and the provision of God in the peace of God flows to others. The shalom and this is the discipline we might want to develop. Today, I want to invite you back to dependence, full dependence on God. Because that's where the root of stress is. That's the only remedy. And I believe we all want that. So will you stand with me now? As we shift back our paradigm in the gospel to dependency on God, will you lift your hands with me to the Lord? Holy Spirit, I want to invite you into this room. I want to invite the presence of God to fill this place. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you.
to give us the gospel again. Jesus, you said in Matthew 11 that all who are weary, burdened, heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. The choice really is simple. In the economy of man, you have to be God. You must fend for yourself. Though there are many variables that you can never control in your sphere of influence, there are spheres of concerns. So therefore, you need to live in fear. You take drugs, you see a psychiatrist, you try to inoculate it the best way you can because... It's true, you are human, you are frail, we are vulnerable. There's no way around it. So you live in petrifying fear because you believe you're God and you need to be the God of your life. That's the human gospel. Now the alternative is God becomes the God of your life. God is already God. That's his job. He already leads. He already tells the sun to rise and fall. He put the universe in its place. Our response in our worship. Is to invite him again. To say, God, I want you to bless my life under your rule and lead my life and be the God of my life. And I want to come to you with all the stress of my life, the time constraint, the obligation, the pressure. And in a sense, I take it out on you. My doubts, my fears, my uncertainties, As Paul promises us in Philippians 4, that a transcending peace will ascend and give us perspective about his plans for our life. So let's pour out our hearts to God now. So we don't pour out the toxins to the people in our lives. we come before you this afternoon and we give you the root not the expression of our stress but the root if we change the root the expression can change but if 
we tried to change the expressions, they will come back. So God, we, we call it for what it is. It's a spiritual issue. Either we live according to the economy of our world or we live according to the economy of God. The economy of God is a place of abundance because God can create from ex nihilo, from nothing, because he's God. In the economy of man, you must fend for the resources that is restrained and the time allotted to meet your obligations. The good news of the gospel Is it God from a place, especially in relational place, has unlimited, infinite love, infinite peace, and infinite compassion for the pressures of our life? And if we drink from it, it will give us the strength and courage to face whatever comes our way as God leads us through those terrains of crisis and stress and pressure. The question is, do you want to do it alone or do you want to do it with the one that holds the universe in his hand? And he could hold you. He got your life. It's all about perspective today. It's our choice. Let's make it. Will you bow your heads for the benediction? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. All God's people say, Amen. Go in peace in the shalom of God. We'll see you soon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stu Still. I'm a small group leader here at 180 Church. I just want to welcome you all to our Sunday service. Before we get started, we just have a couple of quick announcements to go through, and we're going to start off with tithes and offering. Here as members at 180 Church, you know, we know that God is the center of everything that we have. He's the source of everything that we have. He's the one who provides for us. And when we tithe, we give back just a small portion of what God has given to us so that we can continue his mission on earth. And that's why we make it so important, because it's our way of being responsible. It's our way of giving back to God for what he has given given us. It's our way of being faithful to him who's been so faithful to us already. So if you're a member here at 180 Church, we just want to remind you to continue to tithe faithfully. You can give either at the info booth in the back. Uh, you can give online through Chase Quick Pay at offering at 180church.tv, or you can go onto our website and uh, make an offering through PayPal at 180church.tv. Our next announcement is about prayer texting. We have our prayer text line available. It's 5397 prayer. And we also have a email line available, prayer at 180church.tv. And we have this available so that in the things that are going on in our lives, the things that are stressing us, as Pastor Sam talked about a couple of weeks ago, those toxic stresses in our lives that we can't deal with on our own, we can have this uh, available so that we can lift these prayers to God and so that we don't pray for them just on our own, but that we have the prayer team that prays for these things as well so that we're not alone in our struggles, so that we're not alone in the things that are going on in our lives. So if you have something that's going on in your life that you know that you can't do anything about it, but God can, feel free to send a prayer text. Again, it's 5397-PRAYER or prayer at 180church.tv. And when God moves in your life, and so many people have had God move in their lives through this, just send a praise request as well so that we can, we can all celebrate in what God is doing in your life. Our next announcement is about the uh, Bible reading group. We go online here at 180brg.tumblr.com to read just a chapter of the Bible a day. And it's a real easy way, it's a real simple way to just get a little bit better versed in what God has said, what God has done, the promises that he's made and the things that He has done in other people's lives and the promises that of what he can do in our lives as well. And it's a real easy way to just read a chapter a day. You can go on there and you can get it subscribed to your smartphone, to your email, however you want to do it, wherever you want to read it. You can read read it one chapter a day, nice and easy, so you get that better grounding. So we just invite everyone to join us there.
Our next announcement is about small groups, and small groups are where we get together to go deeper into the word, to go deeper into the message, to go deeper into where God is speaking into our lives, directly into our situations and the places where we are, because God always meets us where we are. So this is where we get together to talk about those things in a nice, intimate setting where we can just share it with a smaller group of believers, a smaller group that we're with, to share about where we are and what God is doing in our lives and gain encouragement from other people who have been through the same situations and who have uh, had God move in their lives. So if you're not a member of small group, I just want to encourage you to join one. You can talk with Andrew Park, and he'll get you plugged in. And we have small groups that meet throughout the city and on Staten Island and um, all over the place so that wherever you are in life, and no matter what stage you're in, whether you've been a believer for a while or if you're still investigating who Jesus Christ is, this is the place where you can ask those questions when you can really grow. So again, if you're not a member, just talk with Andrew Park. He'll get you plugged in. And our last announcement is about sharing the message. We have so many different ways that we can share the message, and it's not just face-to-face -face with our friends, but we can also share it through Facebook. Uh, we can share it through YouTube, where we have all of the uh, sermons that Pastor Sam, Pastor Billy, Pastor Lydia have done over the years. Um, all of these sermons are there so that you can tell your friend, hey, I know you're going through this, and you know my pastor spoke about this a little while ago. Let me, let me share the word with you so that you can be encouraged, so that you can see where God is and where he wants to work in your life and where he can help you in this place in your life. Uh, and so many people have been touched by this. You know, I remember Pastor Sam talking about how when he went over to Europe, he met with some people there who live in England that have been touched by, um, you know, God's message here in New York City. The gospel isn't just limited to us here, but it goes all over the world. And when we share it, even if we don't see that immediate result when we share it on our Facebook and we send it out there, somebody will see it. Somebody does see it, and that can change their lives. And it's just a small little thing that we can do just to share it on a Facebook page or just to share it through Twitter, but it does make a difference in people's lives. So we just encourage everyone to continue sharing the gospel. And you know, as you share it, you'll see new faces, new friends, new brothers and sisters coming in saying, I got touched by the, the word of God through YouTube, through Twitter, through Facebook, and that's how I came here. And God has done a great thing in my life. So we just encourage everyone everyone to continue sharing the gospel. Uh, those are all of our announcements today. As always, you can find all of this information and more on our website at 180church.tv.